afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our Talks at Google session today. Um, we are very fortunate to have a guest amidst us who doesn't need any introduction. Seriously, how many people need an introduction to Malcolm Gladwell? <laughs> uh, Malcolm was uh, the best-selling author of The Tipping Point, Blink, Outlier, et cetera. He has received many honors, but I think what he's probably proudest of having accomplished in his life must be the fact that he was our very first authors at speaker way back in 2006. And so that has started <laughs> author's tradition um, where we now have had more than a thousand speakers come over to Google and share with us their ideas. Um, Malcolm has recently written a new book called David and Goliath, and that is what we'll be talking about today. Uh, the format for this, as you can guess, is more of a fireside chat. I have a set of questions that many colleagues have uh, shared with me as things that they'd be interested in hearing Malcolm's perspectives on. But we'll certainly open it up for Q&A with all of you folks, too. And so uh, there are mics, and uh, when it's time, I'll ask you to uh, line up out there. Uh, and then we do have, certainly, books uh, to pass around um, of uh, David and Goliath. So let's give uh, a very warm round of welcome to, to Malcolm Gladwell. Uh, Malcolm, just to kick this off, what would you like to tell us about this new book and why you choose to write it? Uh, well, it's a book called uh, David and Goliath, and it's about underdogs, misfits, and the art of battling giants. Um, it's about a number of things, but it's principally about asymmetrical conflicts um, and the strategies that are available to the uh, weaker side. And um, then sort of sec secondarily, it's about um, the accuracy of our assumptions about advantages and the nature of advantages and disadvantages. Um, so is our perception of uh, in an asymmetrical conflict of one side as the favorite and the other side as the underdog accurate? Um, uh, or is it an illusion based on our own faulty assumptions about the nature of advantage? And then the third argument in the book is that uh, has to do with um, uh, uh, whether adversity is a more useful way of learning certain kinds of lessons than um, uh, than conditions without constraint. Um, so the, it's called David and Goliath because the story of David and Goliath is, in fact, a perfect illustration of this very thing. Um, David's choice of weapon, the sling, is actually an incredibly devastating weapon. Mm -hmm. it, it, uh, a rock play, you place a rock in a leather pouch, and you swing it around at roughly six or seven revolutions per second. You release one of the cords. The rock goes forward at speeds, depending on the weight of the rock, speeds are probably uh, 30 meters per second. Um, the stopping power of a typical projectile um, launched in that way is the equivalent of a 45 caliber handgun. Um, and the accuracy of people in those years with one of these things was extraordinary. We know from primitive tribes that use slings in our, in our um, that uh, somebody with a couple of years of experience can, can hit it, could hit, could hit the center of that clock very easily from where I'm standing. Um, so David, up against Goliath, has superior technology. Um, routinely, slingers defeated heavy infantry, which is what Goliath is, in combat in, in ancient times. In fact, ancient armies had slingers on their kind of payroll for that precise purpose. The minute he takes out the sling and changes the rules of combat, he is the favorite. He's not going to lose, right? There's only Goliath is lumbering. And then the other fascinating thing about that story is that Goliath, there's been this, all this speculation in the medical literature about what's going on with Goliath, because there's all these weird things he does. He moves very slowly. He's led onto the valley floor by an attendant. And the thinking is that he has what's called acromegaly, which is uh, the condition caused by a benign tumor on your pituitary gland that causes overproduction of human growth hormone. He's tall. He's a giant. Giants are often, you know, Andre the Giant had acromegaly. 
We think Abraham Lincoln had acromegaly. When people are unusually tall, that's one of the explanations. And acromegaly has a side effect, which is it compresses the optic nerves. And it, people with acromegaly are often have severe vision problems. Goliath is probably half blind, in other words. So a guy who's half blind goes up against another guy with an incredibly lethal weapon, accurate to within you know, a hair's breadth from 50 yards away, and with a stopping power of a 45 pistol. And yet, for 3,000 years, we've insisted that that guy is an underdog. It's insane, right? It's, a, it's the most irrational reading of the allocation of advantages and disadvantages in that conflict. So the question is, if we are so profoundly irrational in the way we have read um, the relative strengths of the two parties in that most famous of conflicts, how many other situations do we misread? And that's what the book's about. And I think the answer is lots. And, and, and you do talk about quite a few real underdogs in the book as well. And one of the examples you were mentioning at uh, lunch today was, uh, was about this girls' basketball team. Yeah. Tell us about that and how yeah. that was shaped. Well, this is one of the things I got, reasons I got started writing the book is that I ran into a guy, some of you may know, the guy who founded TIBCO, this is Vivek Ranadif. I met him at a conference and didn't realize who he was. Weirdly, by the way, I had another experience with the, in this exact same thing where I met someone at a conference, did not realize where they were, who they were, and just had a conversation about sports as a result. The first person I did this with was Larry Page, <laughs> who I thought, I met him years ago, and I thought he was just a graduate student. And I had no idea. And so I was like, where did you go to school? Oh, you know, I'm from Michigan. So we just talked about Michigan State basketball for about 45 minutes. And then afterwards, people were like, do you know who you were talking to? And I had no clue. Anyway, I did the same thing with this guy, Vivek. So he started telling me about how he coached his daughter's, 12-year-old daughter's basketball team. And because he's Indian, he had no clue about basketball. So he goes to, I mean, <laughs> I. I can relate to that. OK, good, <laughs> just checking. He had, there was no natural reason to assume he would know a lot about that. Uh, Underdog. That's right, exactly. Uh, although only India, a country of a billion people, could claim to be an underdog. Um, so Vivek goes and studies in his kind of software engineer kind of way, goes to study basketball games, and becomes convinced that Americans are completely irrational in the way they play basketball because he doesn't understand why, if you are the weaker party in a game, you don't do the full court press all the time. Because you're going to lose otherwise, right? And by not playing the full court press, you are allowing your opponent to do the, precisely the thing that your opponent excels at, which is to, to pass and dribble and execute choreographed plays. Why would you speed their, uh, their um, uh, their, uh, why, would you, why would you allow them to give, why would, you, why would you give them the easiest possible route to doing the thing that makes them better than you? So he says, your only hope is to slow them down and to defeat them at the things they're not expert at, i.e., play the full court press. If it fails, so what? You're going to lose anyway. But at least you, you've raised your chances of losing from 95% uh, to, something, to something less than 95%. Right? So he teaches this, takes this group of, and he, this is relevant to him because his daughter's team is utterly without any talent whatsoever. These are, <laughs> these are the very, very, very skinny, somewhat nerdy daughters of programmers from Silicon Valley. <laughs> um, so he does this, and he, his strategy is we're not going to learn, you're not going to learn how to shoot, dribble, or pass. <laughs> Um, we're not even going to practice any kind of offensive plays. What you're going to do is we're, I'm going to get you in really, really good shape, and I'm going to teach you to do this for the entire game. And what happens is that if you do this for the entire game in a basketball game made up of 12-year-old girls, the other team will not advance the ball past midcourt. And so Vivek's team starts to win by scores like 8-0. And, um, and they advance to the national championships. Um, it's so, it's such a hilarious story. And of course, the opponents are so um, flummoxed by this, first of all, and then outraged because the thing that Vivek is playing with his 
girls is not actually basketball, right? <laughs> if you don't dribble, pass, or shoot, um, and have no intention of so doing, and if the <laughs> score at the end of the game is something like 6 nothing, that's not basketball. That's another sport. Um, and so they throw chairs on the court. They challenge him to fistfights in the parking lot. They scream at the refs. And he is sort of massively indifferent. To him, this is more of the strange idiosyncrasies of the American sporting personality. <laughs> and, uh, but I love what I, it, that's a, that is a lovely illustration of my very point. Because why does Vivek, why is he compelled to follow this strategy? Because he's got nothing, right? He's got bubkas. He, his girls are incapable of playing the game of basketball, right? So what does that do? It spurs him to find a completely alternate strategy that's far more successful. And this is, of course, the great story of innovation, right? That nothing, um, uh, uh, nothing acts as a greater spur to innovation than um, the absence of advantage. Um, so if that's the case, you know, there must be situations where it is not advantageous to have advantages, right? If his girls, the only situation where he's better off is if his girls are really talented. So there's a series of conditions. You can be, you could have no talent, you can have massive talent, and you can be anywhere in the middle. The only situation where he could also have reached a national championship is in the 99th percentile condition where his team is massively talented. But but had he been in anything other, so he's in the 1% condition. That's advantageous, because that forces you to play the full court press. The 99th percentile condition is advantageous. But the 2 through 98 is not advantageous, because you have no incentive from 2 to 98 to try anything new. right? Your instinct is just to play the game the way the game is supposed to be played. So had his girls been even a little bit better, they would have been worse off. <laughs> right? Yeah. So, so you're saying we should be as bad as we can be? Is well, <laughs> I'm saying that there are, there are situations where being bad is highly advantageous. Um, and you know, if you read, I don't go into this in the book, but if you've read you know, Innovator's Dilemma, that's what Innovator's Dilemma is all about, right? The disruptive outsider is the one who is incapable of meeting the marketplace needs as the market is traditionally defined. They can't do it. Right? So what do they do? They, they try a completely new half-assed approach, which in the beginning doesn't work. Right? But by that very nature of trying something completely outside the mainstream, they end up upending the, um, were they any good, they would never be forced to do that. Um, so it's the same kind of principle. Uh, one of the things that you talk about in the book, uh, which hinders your chance of improving your success, is something that uh, you say that we are all susceptible to. Uh, and the acronym that you use is EICD, mm -hmm. Elite Institution Cognitive Disorder. Sorry. Tell us about that. Well, that because actually, that's something I'm sure we don't the, know anything about. I, <laughs> I gave a talk on this at the Google Zeitgeist Conference. And because I was having fun with it, I invented the acronym for the conference. It's not actually in the book. Um, elite. Uh, institution, cognitive disorder, is the mistaken belief that attending the most elite institution you can get into is always in your best interest. This is false. Um, there are a number of many, many situations where it is not in your best interest to go to, for example, the best school you can get into, but rather it's in your best interest to go to, at the very most, your second choice and probably, ideally, your third or fourth choice. Um, the reason is as follows, that the best predictor of success in a highly competitive environment, like, for example, law school, or more relevant, the one I use in my book is uh, getting a STEM degree, getting a science and math degree. So we, science and math education at the, at the university level is marked by dropout rates that are north of 50%. Most people who try to get a science and math degree fail, right? So the question is, what is the, if you would like to get a science and math degree, what is the optimal strategy? And the optimal strategy is not to go to your best, the best school you get into. Why? Because the best predictor of success in getting a degree is not your absolute level of intelligence, but your relative level of intelligence. It's your class rank, not the 
uh, not the uh, not your um, it's your it's your rank relative to your peers in your class, not your SAT score or your IQ. So you want to basically anyone who uh, the the if you fall in the bottom third of your class, your chances of dropping out uh, rise astronomically. So you should basically follow a strategy that minimizes your chances of falling in the bottom third of your class. What does that mean? Don't go to a good school. <laughs> right? Now, what's fascinating about this, the, <clears throat> the amazing thing about this is that we appear to have consistently undervalued the psychological costs of um, uh, finishing in the bottom half of any competitive situation. In other words, what we overvalue is the prestige of the institution. And what we undervalue is the cost to you of not succeeding at that institution. And so there's a beautiful illustration of this in this study that was done of economics PhDs. So what we do is we take the top 30 PhD programs in economics in America, and we break the students down by their, how they ranked in their class, um, in their graduate class. And then we look at their publication rate six years out of attaining their PhD. These are those who take the academic route. So in, a, in, a, in something like economics, we use your publication rate as a, the number of journals, of papers you get accepted by prestigious journals is used as a proxy for your success as an economist, right? What do we find when we look at that? What we find is the 95th percentile student at Harvard, Stanford, Princeton, MIT, et cetera, publishes a lot of papers as you would expect. They're brilliant. But the drop, the drop off from the 95th to the 80th percentile is astronomical. And by the time you get to the middle of the, of the PhD class at elite schools, they're not publishing at all. Right? In fact, the 95th percentile student at the worst PhD program you can find will publish more and be a more successful economist than the 75th percentile student at Harvard, P MIT, and Stanford. Now, that is, there are many explanations for that, but the most parsimonious explanation is it is so traumatic and humiliating and overwhelming to be in an elite program and see a handful of people just beat the crap out of you that you are permanently impaired. The other, the, and my message at Google Zeitgeist was that, the, that I think the logical response to this line of reasoning is that you should hire only on the basis of class rank and not on the basis of institution. In other words, you should have don't ask, don't tell uh, when it comes to the name of your undergraduate and graduate institution. We should be indifferent to where you went to school. We should only care about how you ranked. Because it's so, if it's so devastating to be anything in, in anything other than the top third of your class, I don't want you <laughs> if you weren't in the top third of your class, right? Now, I'm being playful a little bit here. But the point is that we have, do you see how we have allocated our strengths and our, our, our notion of what is an advantage and what is a disadvantage are allocated in an irrational way? We've, we have... We've become obsessed with the advantages of prestige, but we have not paid attention to the disadvantages of prestige. And that's a mistake. Some people seem to get motivated by being surrounded by people smarter than they are, right? So that's well, not, sort of. Not economics PhDs, apparently. <laughs> um, no, I mean, I would have, I, intuitively, I agree with you, yeah. right? I want to find reasons to like elite institutions. All my friends went to elite institutions. Should I have children? I would want them to go to elite institutions. You know, we're all powerfully. But the problem is that when we go and systematically look for those advantages, we can't find them. So there's a long, I don't go into my book, but there's a long and rich tradition um, in economics um, in which people hunt for the value of an, elite, of an elite education. And they can't find it, right? So we know that. Uh, it is the case that a student who goes to Harvard earns money, more money in the course of their career than a student who goes to the University of Tennessee. Okay, but that doesn't tell you anything at all. What you really need to do is to find two students, both of whom go to, get into Harvard, one of whom goes and one goes to the University of Tennessee, and then see what, compare their career earnings. And when you equalize for the person, you can't find any difference. In other words, 
it's not that, that Harvard is making you earn a lot of money. It's the kind of person who gets accepted by Harvard makes a lot of money, yeah. right? And then there's an even cleverer line of thing, which there's now been like 10 studies on this, and it's so interesting, which is they now look at elite high schools. So what is the benefit of going to a selective high school? Now, intuitively, you would think there, it must show up. There must be some, you must be able to see whether in test scores or the quality of the college you go to or somewhere, we must see some impact of that. And we can't find, uh, we can't find any advantage. It just, everything seems to, once you do that equalization thing, um, uh, you, if you are a smart kid, in other words, it doesn't matter what school you go to. Um, you'll, you know, smart is smart, um, which is intriguing um, finding. Very neat. Thank you. Um, I want to switch topics a little bit. Um, you know, you do a remarkable job of popularizing uh, social sciences. And uh, by the way, I forgot to introduce myself. Uh, I'm Prasad Sethi. I'm part of People Operations, and I lead the analytics group, which is composed of many social scientists. Um, who, who love the fact that uh, Malcolm's work and uh, you know gets gets their kind of thinking into the public limelight? Um, how do you distill and aggregate all of this research that's done in the social sciences and come up with what you think are the most uh, cogent arguments? Because uh, as you mentioned, there are lots of studies done on similar topics, and some of them are uh, point towards one direction, others point towards a different direction, etc. Yeah. Well, I mean, you're looking for trends in the research. Um, and so, for example, the studies I was just mentioning about trying to measure the value of elite schools, that's a very clear trend. And you've got a cluster of studies that have been done in the last two or three years using pretty rich data sets that are all coming to roughly the same conclusion. So when you see that, kind of, that's the sort of thing I'm looking for is, what you want to steer clear of are the one really wacky study that is sitting all by itself. Um, that doesn't mean it's wrong. It's just you have to be approaching with more caution. But um, there's no shortage. I mean, the thing that's fascinating about being a sort of a student of academic research is that um, the number of things that on an academic level are being ideas that are being um, pursued and conclusions that are being drawn that are quite dramatically at odds with conventional wisdom is enormous. There, if you're in the game of, in other words, looking in academic research for ways to challenge the way we think about things, there's an embarrassment of riches out there. I mean, it's not hard to do. So um, to me, what always amazes me is how much um, fascinating and useful material um, lies buried in academia. It just never sees a lot of day because no one uh, bothers to go and, and write about it and popularize it. I mean, it's astounding how, then, you know, if you talk to academics, they have the list of things that they think that the rest of the world is doing long. It's like, it's like this long, right? Um, so it's like, it's, 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 it's not a very difficult process to, um, to, to dissolve. Yeah. Um, related question. Uh, you use a lot of stories to bring your thoughts to life. And the stories add a lot of emotional richness, and you can really connect with them. Uh, but how do, you, how do you ensure that the stories that you're picking are the most representative of the, the yeah. phenomena that you're trying to describe? Because uh, you could probably find a story to fit any theory that you want, yeah. one yeah. story. Um, yeah, you can't, I mean, that, so the, there's a whole set of trade-offs here. Um, storytelling, by definition, has one great disadvantage, which is you are representing a single narrative, a single experience. Um, on the other side of the equation, the story has a massive, storytelling has a massive advantage, which is there is no better way to communicate and move people than through the story. Um, so you're, what, you're look, what I've always tried to do is, the reason I try to balance storytelling and kind of social science research is that I'm trying to find some kind of 
middle ground. I'm trying to find an observation that is being made in the literature or by academics and illustrate it by means of a story. So it's, it's rare that the story comes first. It's not that I hear something cool and then hunt for data to fit that. It's the other way around. I look for an idea that's been expressed in academia and I say, well, how will I, uh, how can I make that story uh, resonant? Um, uh, make that sort of observation resonant. So you, you, you hunt for stories that match this kind of um, uh, idea that you feel has some um, firepower behind it. Um, so there's, but you know, that said, it's a necessarily imperfect process. All my books are massively imperfect. I don't imagine that anyone will ever agree with 100% of the things in my book. I don't even want them to agree with 100% of the things in the book. It, it, that, that's not what you, what, you, you're not looking for converts, right? You're, you want people to start conversations and um, uh, people, writers who are looking for converts are scary. Um, I think you should, what you're looking for is you, wanna, you want people to engage with the ideas and say, you know, I, I did a, a piece for the New Yorker a couple weeks ago about uh, doping in sports. And I happen to be, I'm a big runner, I happen to be, I'm a huge fan of track and field. If my favorite runners were found to be using some kind of PEDs, I would be devastated. Nonetheless, my piece is all about, look at it from Lance Armstrong's point of view, right? Or look at it from Alex Rodriguez's point of view. I would simply pointed out that the arguments that we use to justify our prohibition on performance enhancing drugs are really lame. They're insanely lame and you can't, run around you know, condemning people and suing them and putting them in jail, whatever we do, on the basis of insanely lame arguments. So lame argument number one, for example, the one that I cannot get over is, in baseball, you are allowed, if you're a pitcher, to replace your ulnar uh, collateral ligament in your elbow, which is the principal ligament you use when you throw a baseball, to take it out and replace it from, with a tendon taken from another part of your body or from a cadaver if you so choose. This tendon will, be, will have performance characteristics that are infinitely superior to the ligament that nature gave you. You can swap it out, bring in the bionic ligament, extend your career, be able to throw the ball harder, and what do we do? We think that's fantastic. We embrace 75% of pitchers in the major league have had this procedure done, right? No one bats an eyelash. The guy who pioneered the procedure is considered to be a hero, blah, blah, blah. Alex Rodriguez is a baseball player who decides to take uh, it, uh, uh, testosterone. A naturally, nat he's not taking something from a cadaver. He's taking a naturally occurring hormone approved by the FDA and available through prescription to everyone in this room. And he's decided to take it. And what happens? He's considered to be a massive villain. Lance Armstrong takes his own blood his own blood and re-injects himself with his own blood and he's considered a villain. So wait a minute. On the one hand, people are importing uh, tendons taken from cadavers, right? Which profoundly alter the performance characteristic of the arm they use to pitch. And that's fine. But you can't take your own blood and re-inject yourself with it. And if you do that, you're a cheater. Explain to me why that's, you know, I am perfectly willing to go after Lance Armstrong once someone explains, once someone makes sense of that contradiction. So there is a case where, do I expect to convince all of you of this argument? No. But if I force, by writing stuff like that, force people to just sit down and actually come up with better arguments for why we hate performance enhancing drugs, then I will have succeeded. Uh, I guess uh, that gives us a new benefits idea for Google, bionic <laughs> ligaments for, for our software engineers so they can code faster. <laughs> uh, uh, you, you talk about how lots of studies in academia never find it to the outside world. Mm -hmm. What can we as society do to improve the chances of that? Right? Because there is so much knowledge and it seems like it would be useful in everyday yeah. life. Um, it's a really interesting question. Um, the, in general, uh, I think we have to understand that the, 
the kind of respect that the appropriate attitude of non-specialists uh, to specialists ought to be one of respect, not, um, uh, uh, not in necessarily enthusiasm. You shouldn't always accept what the expert says is to be as true, but you should be respectful of what they know and you don't. Um, and I think that that is an ongoing, unless you take great pains as a society to constantly um, reinforce that idea that experts deserve our respect, experts will not get respect. You're seeing, a, you're seeing a, this is on display right now, right? You have a group of lawmakers who have no respect for the expertise of uh, the economics profession. I literally saw a guy on TV the other day, uh, some lawmaker from somewhere, who's like, I don't know anything about economics. I'll, you know, I know something about what it takes to run a household or something. This is a guy who's in Congress. I mean, it's, that's, <laughs> that's problematic, right? Um, but you, there has to be a kind of, um, uh, we, this is something that you, you can't ever let up on enforcing that as a core ethic in a, in a technologically complex society. Uh, expertise is at the heart of all progress, right? And you have to create the social conditions under which expertise is respected. And if you let, if, if you let down your guard at all on that, crazy things start to happen. You have people running around saying that they don't want to vaccinate their children, and you have people running around saying that it's fine if we defaulted in two weeks. And we have, you know, there's this kind of madness that will, that will, take, that will take, take over. So that's, a, I mean, that's a, not an answer to the question because it's really hard to inculcate that, but the people in this room are, and me, we're all, we're the people who have to do that kind of work, right? Yeah, that makes sense. Um, why don't folks start lining up uh, at the mics? I think we have one out here. Um, if you want to ask a question, uh, but I, I'll keep going on until uh, until you do. Um, as you think about all all the work that you have done, has there been an insight or two that you have captured that's really profoundly shaped your own behavior, your own life? Uh, that's interesting. Um... I, uh, well, I, the book that, Blink, my second book, was the book that affected my, uh, it so profoundly undermined my belief in my own capacity to make good decisions that I feel I floundered for several years after. Um, <laughs> but in all kinds of ways, I just came away from that book um, realizing that the degree to which are um, th th that we massively underestimate the role of the irrational in our own lives. Um, and we're constantly making up stories that make it sound to ourselves like we are behaving in a logical, commonsensical manner, and we're simply not. Um, you know, the, some guy, I, one of the guys I run with is a social psychologist, and he was telling me about this study that was done in recently where that looked at the, um, how the, um, the willingness of a judge to grant parole varied by the time of day. So right before lunch, judges are really, really crabby and don't grant parole at all. And then when they come back from lunch, their rates soar, right? That's the kind of thing where I would imagine that if you lined up all the criminal judges in America and you told them that, they would dispute that so vigorously Right? They're convinced that they approach every case the same, and yet you do the simplest analysis and you discover a very disturbing um, uh, pattern. Now, you know, maybe some part of that is artifactual, who knows? But it, it certainly merits some um, investigation, right? Well, I feel like there's, that, there's versions of that everywhere, and we're so resistant to kind of acknowledging that about our lives. Um, Wait, why don't we take one of the audience questions? Um, so I was really fascinated by your Zeitgeist talk about elite institutions and thinking if we take Google as a potential elite institution, I'm curious your thoughts on the potential damage we may be doing to ourselves and our employees because not everyone here can be the superstar. And yet most of the people coming here were superstars before. Yeah. 
So I'm curious if you have any research or thoughts yeah. on the impact of that for organizations. Yeah, so this is a very interesting question. So how do you restructure organizations such that you minimize the psychological damage of people at the bottom of the hierarchy? So one way is to limit the notion of hierarchy, right? So what is the thing that is so toxic about uh, elite colleges in science and math programs is that necessarily there is a hierarchy. You give out grades and you know where you rank and you're in a classroom setting we are all trying to do the same thing so you can easily compare yourself to your peers and know whether you're behind or right? that those conditions don't necessarily apply in the workplace it's possible to construct workplaces that don't have the toxic element of hierarchy to the same degree right that's the we shouldn't give grades then at google well, I don't know how you, I don't know how you, no, I mean, it wouldn't be as explicit as grades, but I'm saying that there are, you can organize a workplace in a very, very hierarchical way, or you can choose not to. Um, the other thing that it would tell you is, it would, it would say something about whether, about the size of teams as well. I mean, it would seem to argue, I would think, um, although maybe not, it says, it's really about the structure of, of teams, that to the extent that you can keep things that, um, that are as flat as possible, I think you minimize the damage caused by um, hierarchies. Hi, thanks for coming to speak. So I just started in people operations about a month ago, and since I've been here, I've had a lot of people recommend uh, Strength Finder and other books like that, and I've taken a look at it, and I can't help but think that things like that are kind of, uh, as the great skeptic James Randi said, flim flam, mm -hmm. um, or like, modern day uh, pseudo social science. And I'm wondering what, if you have any insight into those because I know companies spend a lot of money buying those kinds of books for their yeah. employees. I have, uh, I have to confess I've never read any of those. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, um, I know that they're very successful. Um, in, sell, in sales or in, in what they set out to in do? In sales. Yeah, okay. um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I guess I would only say it, it should, it's interesting though that there is such a hunger for that kind of thing. You know, people, I always say this, people are experience rich and theory poor, mm -hmm. that most people necessarily um, lack access to organizing principles in their life. Um, if you're not immersed in the world of academia and you don't have the leisure to, produce, to follow and acquire grand theories, you don't have theories to explain things. So whenever there is someone comes along with an explanatory mechanism for something that is that you're experience rich in, it's enormously attractive. Um, so that, you know, if that's a lousy, if Strength Finder is lousy, it's incumbent on us just to come up with better and more sophisticated ways of, um, but it's, it's clear that there is a massive demand for something um, to allow people to organize their experience. Hey Malcolm, my name is Mike. Thanks for being here. Um, my question is kind of going back to the value of elite institutions again. Um, so. So you talk about how someone who goes to Harvard, someone who goes to University of Tennessee, they are intrinsically going to do the same if they're, um, you know, on the same intelligence level. So I guess my question is, you know, you hear you're kind of the average of the five people you hang around. You surround yourself with people who are smarter than you. You will naturally elevate your level. Do you believe in that, or do you believe that's kind of, you know, it seems like your theory is, is kind of uh, puts the merits towards that. You know, yeah. thought process. Well, there's a, so a couple of things. One is that um, one of the implications of that argument is that there are a lot more very able people at um, non-elite institutions than we think. And actually, this is kind of a fascinating thing. So to take a step backwards, uh, the larger question is, how efficient are elite educational institutions um, in, as search engines for talent? What percentage of the of qualified students do they actually uncover? And, and the answer is, we used to think they were very efficient. What we have discovered recently is they're actually quite inefficient. In other words, enormous numbers of very, very intellectually capable people never even come close to the 250 top colleges in the country. So non-selective colleges have a much larger share of, uh, of the intellectual aristocracy than we would imagine. So that's so, so to your question, if you go to the University of Tennessee, you can find 
lots and lots and lots of very, very intellectually cap capable people to hang around with. And you probably will grab, if you are that kid who could have gone to Harvard, you will probably gravitate to those five. The difference being that, so you'll be surrounded by peers who may be every bit as able. The difference is that you will almost certainly be the top of your class as opposed to running the risk of being in the middle of the bottom. So you're getting two um, benefits, intellectual benefits, as opposed to maybe only one. Um, the other thing, of course, is that, uh, well, I'll leave it at that. There are many, many parallel arguments along these lines. Now, of course, not everyone can follow the strategy. If everyone does it, it ceases to work, right? <laughs> everyone can't go down a notch. Or <laughs> So the whole thing is, I, if you're going to follow the strategy, do it quick before I sell too many books <laughs> and the advantage is wiped out. But, uh, <laughs> okay, thank you. So you said in response to a previous question that it would be useful to eliminate some hierarchy so that you get rid of this problem of people being at the bottom. Mm -hmm. But how do we know that's the bigger issue as opposed to it's just a great boost to people when they are at the top? And if that was the predominating factor, then maybe we should just have more awards or more way to recognize people. Oh, I see. Oh, you mean have a kind of pretend hierarchy where you <laughs> give everyone a pat on the back? Or maybe we should have even more levels of hierarchy. Oh, I see. Well, but the, you know, the, um, so the classic study, and I have to see if I got this right. The classic study in this regard, which I talk about in the book, is this famous study that was done in this, the largest psychological study ever in the United States was done during the Second World War of American soldiers. And one of the most interesting insights was a comparison of, um, uh, of commissioned officers in the Air Force, the Air Corps, the precursor to the Air Force, and commissioned officers in the military police. And the question was, who was more satisfied with, uh, um, with their promotion prospects, the openness of their uh, institution to rewarding talent? And the answer was that the uh, people in the military police were way more satisfied with that than the people in the Air Force. This was very puzzling because almost no one got promoted in the military police and everyone got promotions in the Air Force. So why would people be more satisfied in the military police? Well, the answer is that so many people got promoted in the Air Force that getting promoted was meaningless, right? Um, so few people got promoted. The, the median condition in the military police was not getting promoted. So if you didn't get promoted in the military police, you're like, well, no one is. It's fine. If you didn't get promoted in the, mil in the Air Force, oh, man, you're devastated because everyone's getting promoted, right? And if you did get promoted, it's like, who cares? Everyone's getting promoted. So it's like, do you see that the, the <laughs> it's this totally inverted thing. You think that you're making life better by promoting everyone, but you're not. You're simply creating, you're simply altering the set of existing expectations. Um, so the, so yeah, I don't know whether you can, um, messing around with hierarchies is a very, 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 very tricky business. And it's probably better just to try to avoid them when you can. Thanks. Uh, go ahead. Hi, Malcolm. Thanks for coming in. Um, my question is a little bit around, I guess, your media diet. Obviously, as someone that writes a lot about social science, you have to go through a lot of academic journals. But what I was actually really interested to see was that you had a really, I think, cogent and, and fluent conversation with Bill Simmons, often on his blog, about sports and different topics. So I was wondering a little bit about your media diet outside the academic journal sphere and like how you kind of keep your mind and horizon broad yeah. across different topics. Well, I'm a huge sports fan. so. There's an enormous amount of consumption of sports-related stuff. Uh, and um, particularly these days, I, I spend an enormous amount of time watching obscure European track and field meets on sort of live streams at 2 in the morning. Um, so there's that. And then, uh, but I think, you know, my strategy has always been you can't, you have to very consciously differentiate yourself from where you think you're, professional peer group is going. Um, so the, to the extent that people are, my, to the extent that people migrate to things that are accessible online, I feel I should uh, migrate to things that are inaccessible online. So the value, or to the extent that people stop reading books and read, I feel I need to read more books. Um, so I've been tr what I've been trying to do is to kind of, it's why I spend a lot of time in actual physical libraries reading things in hard copy because there's a kind of a serendipity that you get when you 
This is not in any way meant as a criticism, by the way, of search engines, for example, <laughs> which are incredibly useful, but they are, but they, you know, they also have limitations. They reward a certain kind of serendipity, and they punish another kind of serendipity, right? And if you really want to, if you're interested in serendipitous learning, as I am, much of what I uncover is uncovered serendipitously. You have to be a student of all of the different mechanisms of chance encounters with the unusual and the insightful. And so that means that not only do I spend a lot of time screwing around online on databases, but I also very, very consciously make sure that I go to physical libraries and walk through the stacks. And even something as simple as you're interested in one book, and then you go and you just look at all of the books that surround it. Right? And the connections are not always, the connections are, there's, there are connections between them, but it's a different kind of connection than they would be connected online. It's not a keyword connection, right? It's a thematic connection or it's a, so there's all these sorts of, you have to be a student of these kinds of, um, of, the, of the different ways in which ideas cluster. Um, and so that, and I've been, I thought a lot about that in recent years as a way of distinguishing myself from um, other journalists. Thank you. Hi, I have a quick question. In your last uh, book, Outliers, you spoke about uh, the advantages of, you know, whether it's being born in a certain year or having access to the earliest computers and stuff like that. And in this book, you have a whole new section called the disadvantages of being advantageous. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you see a contradiction or if how do you reconcile the two? Yeah. Well, I have several answers to that question. Um, <laughs> Uh, so there's clearly a difference between the notion that I play with in this book is called desirable difficulty. And desirable difficulty is a class of, uh, of difficulties that have paradoxical outcomes that force you to do things that end up being advantageous. So um, there's, a whole, there's a whole school of, uh, of research around these people at UCLA called the Bjorks who try and uncover specific examples of desirable difficulties. A good one would be, for example, a simple one would be um, studying strategies. Uh, the, to the extent that you can make your studying process more difficult, you will retain more information. So the Bjorks have these beautiful data that says if you're learning um, something very complex, um, the best thing to do is to learn it in small chunks. So say I have three tasks that require mastery. I have two choices. I can master the first, master the second, and master the third, or I can break up all the learning into 10-minute chunks and do 10 minutes, 10 minutes, 10 minutes, 10 minutes, 10 minutes. They say do the latter, even though it's harder. Even though you have to start over every time, right? You go 10 minutes, 10 minutes, and you come back to the first thing, and you're like, oh, what was I doing again? And it's like this re-entry problem. It's like the re-entry problem is not a problem. It's why you will remember and master it way better. It's forcing you, to your brain, to kind of go into a different mode. So, they, so the idea is that, yeah, there's a set of things. Getting access to, if learning programming is, requires 10,000 hours of mastery, and you're in a condition where access to computers is constrained, early access to computers will be an unalloyed advantage, right? But that doesn't mean that there aren't other situations that we can find um, where what looks like where access to something um, preferentially may look advantageous and not be advantageous at all. So my discussion of dyslexia in the book is all about conditions under which dyslexia can, not knowing how to read can be advantageous. Why? Because the strategies that you might follow to work around your reading problem can end up being more helpful to you than reading. So I I have this long thing about the David Boys, the lawyer who basically can't read, and as a result, developed an incredible capacity to listen and an incredible memory. If you're a trial lawyer, believe it or not, it's more important to have an amazing memory and be an incredible listener than it is to know how to read. Right? Not if you're a litigator or a corporate lawyer, but if you're a trial lawyer, yeah. Not if you're a, sorry, a corporate lawyer, but if you're a trial lawyer. So we can clearly, I don't think it's, we can clearly say, look, there are desirable difficulties and there are undesirable difficulties. Um, that said, on a broader macro level, is there a possible contradiction? Yeah. But <laughs> so what? Like, we're all, 
we're all adults. I don't know why people are so terrified of contradiction. I think contradiction is like, it's fine. I mean, I can identify hundreds of contradictions in my own life. All of you can. It's, in fact, I've, I've recently been, I've gotten so interested in this, I've, that I'm doing, I was, been, this next project I'm working on is all about the centrality of contradiction in human behavior. And that instead of, the idea has always been that as human beings, what we seek to do is to locate and extinguish contradictions. I think that's nonsense. And there's a lot of very interesting social science research which suggests, to the contrary, what we do is we exploit, we aggressively exploit our contradictions. They enable us to do all kinds of, not always good things. Um, so I'm very interested in, I was talking about this at lunch, very interested in this notion that um, we are sometimes behave generously or pro-socially pro towards an outsider group in order to justify turning on them in some future situation. And I, the, I have this, this the, the, the incredible example of this is Adolf Eichmann, the architect of the final solution, who spends the 1930s pretending, not pretending, pretending, convincing himself that he's a Zionist. He, uh, reads books on Zionism, he goes to Jerusalem, he uh, hangs out with the rabbis of Vienna, he uh, teaches himself Hebrew, and he does this, and what that means is that when it comes time to, and he's responsible in the 30s for deporting thousands of Jews from Vienna to Palestine. What does that do? It enables him, when he, when he turns to exterminating Jews, to be able to say to himself, in his grotesque way, I don't hate Jews. I was deporting them, I was saving them. I was reading Hebrew and going to Jerusalem and, and at one of the death camps that he sets up, he builds a library and he imports Judaica from a prominent Jewish library in Prague. And he would go and visit this place, this grotesque concentration camp, and sit in the library and read ancient Hebrew manuscripts he, at his core, this man had a massive contradiction, and he wasn't driven to resolve it. He used it to justify everything he did over the course of the war, right? Now, that's a horrible, extreme, grotesque example. But my point is that we all have within us these contradictions, and I, I, I think that's part of what it means to be human. And just as you can use contradictions for terrible ends, like Eichmann did, they are also, at the same time, the ways in which we explore new ideas and expose ourselves to risky things and do all kinds of things that are ultimately positive. And if you're not willing to tolerate contradiction um, in your own life, I think you're, you're, you're um, limiting yourself in a certain sense. Um, uh, you're also running, you're running huge risks. In being, you know, like Eichmann route is the risky route, right? But at the same time, Someone who insists on that everything be absolutely consistent is leading an impoverished life, um, I think. Um, so I, yeah, I try to do this all the time. Thank you. Why don't we take one more question? In the context of Google and the innovator's dilemma that you mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. when you are a giant, how do you stay a giant and kind of towards the book not be slayed by a David? Oh, wow. Well, you know you will be, eventually. Right? Um, I mean, give me an example of... You know, there is these... What's fascinating about... So in your space, there's kind of IBM, which does this thing which in retrospect seems unbelievable, right? That they managed to kind of resuscitate themselves and transform themselves. But they had, they might be uh, sui generis. You know, it's, maybe they were just in such an unusual position and had, were so deeply rooted in so many parts of the world and had such a deep bench that that was possible. But the rule is, you don't get to, it's not gonna last longer than a generation or so. And maybe that's, maybe part of the answer is, that's fine. As long as you don't think about Google, as long as you think about you, right? So um, years ago, I remember doing this. It's the first time I, this was hit home to me. Um, I went to Rochester, and in Rochester, 
in the, it used to be a high technology hub, right? Kodak, uh, Xerox, Bausch & Lohm. But one of the biggest employers in Rochester, high tech employers in the 1960s was uh, General Dynamics, I think General Dynamics, one of the big defense contractors. They employed vast numbers of engineers. And they basically, their business model implodes after the Vietnam War and they shut down their operations in Rochester and moved away. And everyone said, oh my God, it's over, right? One of the biggest employers in town has folded. And what happened if you went back 10 years later was you discovered that the talent that left, that was kicked out of General Dynamics, went on to start so many startups in Rochester that they sparked a whole second wave that ended up actually being, um, in terms of employment and income brought into the city, greater than the benefit General Dynamics had, had risen. In other words, so Google may f fall one day, probably will, but you won't. You all guys will all, hopefully, many of you will go on and do other incredibly cool things because of what you, in part of what you learned while you were here. So you, you can look at it two ways. There's a pessimistic view, but there's also a view that says, no, it's part of the natural cycle. You probably don't want to be working at Google. Am I, is this horrible to say? <laughs> um, 25 years from now. <laughs> you know, you, and nor does society want you to be if, if this company doesn't evolve in dramatic. Maybe it will. I mean, I'm just using Google as a stand-in for, let's use another company. Let's say, <laughs> let's say Microsoft. <laughs> I mean, at this point, would the world be better off if Microsoft disappeared tomorrow? M yeah. <laughs> how, many, how many unbelievably talented people are trapped working on the umpteenth version of Word? <laughs> right? Like, that's not a good use of 150 IQ points. Um, so I don't, you know, I would, I'd be, I would be less, um, I'd be more kind of sanguine about this problem than you might be at the moment. Awesome, thank you. <laughs> I can't think of a better note to end on, so.